to today's presenter. His name is Gavin Finn. And with more than 25 years of success in building growth-oriented marketing and technology companies, Gavin is currently president and CEO of Kayon Interactive, the leader in interactive digital marketing applications for the enterprise. Under his leadership, the company has helped B2B organizations such as Cisco, IBM, Orthoclinical Diagnostics, GE, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Rico, Amazon, Dell, Siemens, HPE, and many, many more increase sales productivity and reduce marketing costs. Prior to Kayon, Gavin was president and COO of Blue Streak, a provider of online marketing software. He led the company through three successful acquisitions and a European marketing expansion. He was also the president and CEO of Precedent Technologies, a provider of data quality and automation software. He holds both a PhD and an MS from MIT and teaches entrepreneurial marketing at Tufts University. Last month, Gavin was awarded a transformative CEO award for customer experience in the category of digital transformation from the CEO Forum Group. His brilliant industry and vertical knowledge spans many arenas, providing an excellent foundation for today's webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn things over to Gavin to begin today's event. Gavin, welcome. Thank you, Dana, and thank you everybody for joining us today. We're talking about something very timely. We've obviously been through a great deal of change in the last few months. And many people are wondering how to transition from face-to-face -face meetings, be they customer briefings or trade shows or conferences or company events, to the digital world. And so lots of input from different sources have created quite a bit of discussion and our goal today is to help guide some of that discussion to lead to your success in transitioning into bringing benefits of face-to-face -face meetings to the virtual digital environment. Before we get started, we have a poll that we'd like to ask you, which really relates to your intentions for this year. And let's get started with a question about whether you're going to be attending or hosting any in-person live events in 2020. And as we go through the course of this discussion, we'll be asking some questions, you'll be providing answers. We're actually going to share some experiences together, virtual experiences in the digital world. And so this will hopefully create a sense of both awareness and interest, as well as your um, participation to really guide some of these discussions. So please answer these questions um, so that we can get a sense and we can base our focus as we move forward on how we plan on going through transitioning and managing through this time that we're in. As soon as the results are in, we will have a quick sharing of the poll uh, to talk a little bit about the uh, total sort of distribution for our um, participants today. And as soon as we get through them, I think we're very close we'll see that um, there's still a lot of optimism around, um, go back to the previous poll. Just, actually, why don't we do this one then at the same time? And, uh, we can share the results. You can see that um, a lot of people are planning on attending or hosting live events sometime this year. And about 25% of the people on this poll, the hundreds of people who are participating today are not planning on doing anything with respect to live events for the remainder of this year at least. Uh, so that actually tells us quite a bit about the, um, the distribution of sort of our sentiment. Now we're here because things have changed and we've talked a little bit about the vector of that change and see how that's going to work. Um, and then what we will do is as we go through, we'll talk a little bit about some of our options. But let's start by understanding why it is that we crave face-to-face -face events and what makes those face-to-face -face events so valuable. It turns out that people who attend face-to-face -face events actually do so for primary reasons relating to interacting with other people. And even though we don't have uh, necessarily an overt rationale behind this, we know as human beings, based on our cognitive behavior, our limbic brains tell us that there are some cues that go along with whether to trust people or how to interact and how to read and interpret what they're saying. And many of those cues have nothing to do with what they're saying, but it has to do with their body language, their smiling, 
whether they laugh or not, or how they gesture. These kinds of cues actually influence in a subliminal way how we perceive the people and what they're saying. And it turns out that the result of all of those cues is that when we have face-to-face -face encounters, it's much more likely that we are likely to agree with or be persuaded by people that we're actually encountering in those environments. And this is useful to us because it does help us understand what the rationale is for both sponsoring and attending these events and to try to think about how we might actually do some of these same sorts of um, messaging in a virtual or digital environment. Now, everybody has been thinking about sort of why we do face-to-face -face meetings. And the reality is that the vast majority of people uh, create and attend events so that they can interact with other people, with other companies. In fact, the CEIR did a study, series of studies, and what they determined was that for people attending face-to-face -face events, be they trade shows, conferences, or meetings, what they found was that there are three primary reasons that motivate people that drive them to these events. The first one is education. They want to learn about the industry. They want to learn about different companies and they wanna learn about their own particular discipline. And so what happens is they go to these events with a thirst for knowledge, a thirst for education, and they derive that education in a variety of different ways, not the least of which are breakout sessions and workshops and even keynote addresses where they can learn some information. But in addition to that, all of the other kinds of interactions provide education for them to help them both as professionals and individuals, but also in their decision-making in their roles. The second, primary reason is to learn about new products and services in the industry, potentially for areas that they might not encounter in their everyday professional lives. So they go to these events to create an environment where there's one place that they can get a sense of what's going on in the industry and how things are evolving and what's relevant to them. And the third and turns out to be the most uh, important reason to all of the people who responded to these surveys both by CIR and the CMO Council, were that people were driven to these events so that they can meet and interact with people in and around their industry in a way that they typically could not in their normal course of their professional days. So when they encounter people, sometimes it's in a formal setting, you're in a workshop, you're encountering people, a presenter or somebody who's an industry expert, but often what they were told is that it's the casual, unexpected encounters, those interactions with people that they didn't anticipate, that were equally valuable. Now, the interactions that we want to create from the exhibitor's perspective actually um, also are driven by three primary motivators to interact with, with the audience. So if you're an exhibitor or a sponsor, the three primary reasons for exhibiting are to create awareness around your product or your company, um, to do lead generation with people who you had not met before, and um, equally important, to meet with your existing clients in one environment. And so those primary drivers cause us to want to interact as opposed to doing this kind of research from our offices. Now, if we're going to think about recreating or developing the same sorts of um, experiences and results in the current environment, we have to really look at what's happening with the pandemic and the economic impact thereof. First of all, we're in a current phase right now, which everybody sees as sort of emerging from lockdown globally in different, at different speeds and at different rates. We're gonna enter another phase where potentially we'll have antibody studies that will tell us accurately um, how we can interact with people and who's at risk and who isn't at risk. And then finally, we're gonna enter a phase where people get vaccinated so we feel much more comfortable and safe doing the kinds of things that we were used to doing in the past. Those phases are likely to transcend this year and go into the following years. So what we're really thinking about expecting is not only do we have a short-term need to transition from face-to-face -face events to digital, but we also have a medium and a long-term need to think about how we can turn this short-term situation into a way of transforming what we've been doing to something better overall. Now this really comes down to the fact that it's not just the short-term economic impact that we're facing, it's actually impact on the entire employment situation, but also practices, travel practices, interactive practices, whether it's trade shows, 
even if we are able to get back to certain kinds of face-to-face -face events this year, they probably won't look and feel the same as they did before. And so when we think about the, the imperatives that result from this experience, it drives us to certain key objectives that we need to take into account as we build out a vision for a digital or a virtual environment. And so I think what we'd like to start in the next sort of phase with is asking everybody here, and Dana, if you could actually uh, push this poll out, that'd be great. What you believe for your organization or you personally, the three greatest um, value statements are for why you do face-to-face -face engagements and, and what's important to you and your company. What are the key drivers for doing these face-to-face -face -face en encounters? And how is it going to frame sort of your thinking about what your objectives are? And as we're talking about this, I think what we really need to be thinking about is the purpose. Not necessarily we do it because it's expected of us, but what is it that we're trying to accomplish? What, what are the key things that would make a difference for us and would make this an important part of our marketing and our sales and our corporate uh, customer engagement experience uh, to be able to have these face-to-face -face encounters. Um, and I won't prejudice any responses by talking about industry studies, but what we'll find is that there's going to be uh, two or three sort of leading factors that will allow us to sort of focus in on some of the, the driving forces for what we need in a, a, a next state or a future state. So as we look through this, what we're finding is that um, I think we're almost ready if everybody seems to have uh, answered the poll. I think we're close to the end, yep. So what we see is that the most important factor in creating face-to-face -face events is to drive stronger and more meaningful business relationships. Uh, following on that, the next two are to increase engagement and to more easily demonstrate products and services. So if you think about those three, drive deeper and uh, more meaningful business relationships, increase engagement, and be able to demonstrate the solutions that we bring to the table. Those are what drives I need to have these events. So this is important because as we go through this, what we're actually seeing now is what the purpose is of whatever events we create, digital, face-to-face, uh, -face, hybrid, in the future, they need to meet those key business objectives. Interestingly enough, just in the pre-COVID world, um, the CIR and CMO Council did a bunch of research relating to the effectiveness of real face-to-face -face meetings, trade shows, and exhibits. And they asked the exhibitors, with respect to your key objectives, how effective is your face-to-face -face trade show exhibit and meeting program? And it turns out that only 6% of companies that sponsored or exhibited at events said that they had met their business objectives. Keep in mind what your statements were just a few minutes ago with respect to more meaningful business relationships, increasing engagement, and being able to demonstrate our solutions and products, very much in line with what the key objectives are for most companies who exhibit and go to trade shows. Uh, exhibitors are not particularly satisfied that those key objectives are being met. Similarly, in the same uh, time period, CIR and CMO Council did a research on attendees and asked them, did these trade shows, events, meetings, product launches meet your needs? And it turns out only 34% of the attendees said that they did. Now, what this really means for us is that there's room for improvement. It's not a detractor on one particular form or another, but it's basically saying that with respect to these objectives, and this is where marketing can actually create a much more aligned strategic impact with senior executives is how to align the actual marketing activities, trade shows, events, product launches, briefing centers, as part of the sales infrastructure to drive the results that we need to increase and deepen our business relationships, to um, drive more engagement and interaction, and to better be able to demonstrate and articulate the value of our products and solutions. And the attendees are pretty much going for the same things. And so even offline, these particular objectives are not really being met to the extent that they can. So what this is telling us, we don't want to go on this journey and have the past be our destination. We want to go on this journey and improve. We want to create a better future 
so that our objectives are actually met, be they as a combination of hybrid or offline or digital events. And what's really driving this is that most individuals who attend these events are looking for interaction. They're looking for engagement. And this is an important point for us because as we move to digital or virtual events, what that tells us, be aware that that's a primary motivator and we need to deliver on that even as we start down this journey. It can't be a second step or a third step because we're gonna end up failing if we don't create this kind of engagement and interactivity. Now, what does it mean to create interactivity and engagement? There's actually three dimensions on which you have to connect in order to create a truly engaging and interactive experience. One of them is a multi-sensory experience where you create audio, visual, and um, touch-based or manipulation-based sensory experiences. And so if you think about you're actually driving the experience, you were doing a poll, you were listening, you were watching, um, those are multi-sensory experiences. The second part is an intellectual knowledge transfer. We can't just do this in a vacuum and have a great pinball experience, but there's no knowledge transfer. We're not getting educated. Remember that the people people who are attending these events are driven by education. They want to learn. They want to learn about the industry. They want to learn about their discipline. They want to learn about their companies and products. So in this process, we have to be effective at conveying salient issues, differentiated value, key uh, resonance with the attendees, each persona. And then the last and very important component in the B2B world, most people tend to forget we have to be able to connect on an emotional level. So when we create these multisensory experiences and we create an intellectual knowledge transfer, there also has to be an emotive content capability to this, where we actually drive emotional connections and putting those three things together, that's what a successful engagement interaction looks like. That's customer engagement. So what I'd like to ask at this point is given what we have talked a little about so far, when you do virtual meetings or briefings or events, what are the things that are lacking that you'd like to see actually extend what you've already done or seen as an attendee or as a host? And we've seen lots of companies transition from physical events to digital events. And in many of these, what we see is that there's a lackluster response on the part of the attendees. So you could be one of the attendees as well. And what has been missing with respect to the key objectives in the virtual events that you've hosted or the digital events that you've attended, what's been missing? Uh, we, we had an example for, uh, just to talk through this while you're, you're going through this, um, there's a very large corporation that had their major customer event, which usually has 30,000 attendees in Las Vegas. That was canceled this year, and they decided to move that all online, so they created a digital event. So one of the great benefits of that is the digital event could be available to people everywhere. They didn't have to travel to Las Vegas. What ended up happening is they ended up with 100,000 registrants, which was spectacular. So they got literally more than three times the registration numbers as they would have if, they were, if the event were to be face-to-face uh, -face live. What ended up happening, however, is they ended up creating the event in such a way that the experiences that the attendees had um, didn't meet their expectations. And in fact, the satisfaction surveys at the end of this uh, digital trade show survey were at the digital event were much lower satisfaction rates than they were for any other uh, of the previous year's face-to-face -face events. So even though they got more registrants and actually more attendees, um, they didn't end up satisfying the needs. So here what we can see uh, at the end of this poll is that the things that are lacking, the number one and number two things that are lacking are building stronger and more meaningful business relationships, having greater social interactions, and uh, increased engagement. Now think about that. That's very, very similar. And with respect to products and services, it's almost the same uh, number, 35%. Now, just take a moment and think about that. The things we really need to achieve, the things that are driving our events, creating a better and deeper engagement, meaningful business relationships, having more engagement in social interactions, and being able to actually convey value propositions for our products and solutions. Those are the very things that you've just said are lacking in the virtual environment. 
So what this does for us is it tells us that we can't just stick to what we've done in the past. We can't just recreate, reopen, redo, and return to the digitized version of the face-to-face -face event, because that's pretty much what everybody's been experiencing so far is essentially a replication of that event. And, you know, it's just interesting because Forrester just in the last month did a, um, a research study on virtual event platforms. And one of the key findings that they had, that they recommended was that they said companies must use online to deliver experiences in ways that don't look and feel like a digital only version of a physical death. And really, when you think about it, that's the reason that all of those elements that you felt were missing were missing is because it's really becoming a digitized version of that face-to-face -face event. So what we really need to think is all through these different phases, what is the capability for us to interact? And what do we need? What kind of transformation do we need? So obviously in lockdown or just coming out of lockdown, there's gonna be some limited engagements and there's gonna be something in the future. We're not sure what it is. Regardless of how that trans uh, transpires, we need to create something. We need to create a platform that solves the problem we just talked about, which is creating more meaningful business relationships. So what we have to do is we really have to do a digital transformation exercise. We have to go from transactional to a collaborative process. We have to stop thinking about events and marketing um, engagements like this as costs, as expenses, and we have to start tying them directly to the business results we're trying to achieve which have to do with the things you just said, which is creating more meaningful business relationships, being able to differentiate our products and solutions better and create these interactions on a more uh, repeatable basis. So that means we're going from a cost-based thought process, what's it gonna cost us to do this event, to what's the value? A value-focused structure on how we can create digital events and virtual events. And that really means that we have to transform from discrete products and optimizing particular events for a particular product launch or a particular a dimension of our portfolio or a particular geography or a theme, we have to create a networked environment where we're really optimizing our portfolio rather than a particular segment of that portfolio. And that way we can actually reuse and repurpose all of these events, the digital versions of these events in a way that the engagement transcends that one particular moment in time. And that's gonna create for us a much more effective way to think about how we're actually pivoting from where we are to where we need to be. So let's start by just looking at what happens when you just think about a virtual event platform, what do you get? And this is where a lot of companies are starting and we're gonna go very quickly from looking at this to the kinds of things that we could actually accomplish. So when you get a virtual uh, event platform, the kinds of things that come with that mirror and are very similar to the kinds of things you might get with a, virtual, with a real trade show or a real event. You get a website, you get marketing associated with that, you get registration, there's an agenda, a complex agenda, potentially multiple uh, working sessions at the same time. You get some capability to do live presentations, a live video feed, you might have live uh, audio and video, questions and answers, very similar to what we're talking about here, polling. Some of them have note taking and attending, uh, attendees being able to take notes and select slides and, and presentations if they're favorites, to be able to record and share content later and create these kinds of feedback. So that really, if you think about it, that's sort of the uh, digital twin of a physical event. And it, it creates that uh, equivalence in that environment. Now, one of the problems with doing that is that when you're actually at an event, let's say those people went to Las Vegas and they went to that, that show, they're actually physically at the show, they're physically at the event, that's what they're focusing on. They're there, um, that's where their attention is. And it turns out that when we take that event and we put it into one of these kinds of platforms and deliver the same sort of content and the same kind of experience and give people the same sort of agenda, you know this because you're doing this now almost every day where you're looking at digital content and you're interacting in this kind of a feed environment and you have distractions. And so what this percentage represents, and this is a survey and an analysis and a series of studies that were done by uh, logging in and go to meeting where they actually analyzed how much of the time that an event is going on where somebody's attending that they're actually paying attention. So this is the attention rate. How much of your, 100% of your attention are you paying even though you're attending? It's 23%. So think about that. 
you only have 23% of people's attention. And if you're not creating that interaction and that engagement during that 23%, your effectiveness is almost zero. So it's not surprising that all of those digital attendees, the attendees who attended the digital conference that we just talked about, um, were very unhappy with the effectiveness of that event because it just did not convey the kinds of things that they went to the event or would have gone to the face-to-face -face event uh, to, to learn. And this, the message here is very clear. Virtual conferencing tools, these kinds of connection tools by themselves are not enough. They're not even enough as a starting point. It's not actually valuable to just say, well, let's get started with that. Let's just do an event or two or this year on these platforms and then we'll elevate next year or we'll elevate the next few because these first few that you do are going to fail. They're gonna fail because they don't create that kind of engagement and they don't solve the problems that you just said were critical to you and were missing from these face-to-face -face events. So what we really need to do is we need to couple these with the kinds of solutions that provide engagement. The kinds of engagement where people are interacting, where there's a clear persona-based personalization of the path that you go through, the information is relevant, and it's not presented to the audience, but it's interactive, it's interactive so that they're absorbing it and they're making buying decisions based on the information that they are uncovering, that they're revealing to themselves rather than sitting in a presentation which doesn't actually deliver. And these kinds of experiences, these kinds of interactive elevations are actually um, fairly uh, broad in the kinds of interactions that you can have. It could be interactive product and solution demonstrations. Remember one of the key items in all of our polls that we just had was that we needed to be able to demonstrate the differentiated value of our products and solutions. We have the ability to actually interact with and demonstrate and learn about products. We want to be able to do non-linear storytelling. Think about it when you're watching a video or you're seeing a PowerPoint, everything is linear. Everybody's getting to see the same thing at the same time. Maybe you want to put in our data. We want to say, well, this is my situation. This is how many square feet I have in my factory. These are the, the instruments I have in my lab and this is the throughput I need. Or maybe this is the, the, uh, the kind of classroom that I have with the number of students. So you want to be able to create your personalized value out of these kinds of solutions based on your data. And then you want to have some interactive interaction so that you're not just sitting there watching. So the result of this is that if you can, in the context of these digital or virtual environments, insert that interactive capability, what you're going to do is you're going to increase your customer knowledge about the things that's important to them. The old Chinese saying, which said, um, tell me and I will forget, show me and I will remember, involve me and I will understand. We want to get them involved, we want them to understand, and they're going to get to make better buying decisions. So this is important because we want them to make better buying decisions. So together, let's go through and see some experiences, but let's strategically commit that we're not going to just recreate a digital twin of a face-to-face -face meeting that is, in Forrester's words, um, a replication, which basically says that we, we are replicating the physical gathering and we're not elevating it. Remember that the results from our physical gatherings were not that great, let's elevate it. So let's see what that means. And what that means is instead of creating a virtual trade show floor, let's create environments. Let's create digital environments that look and feel like the customer's environments. So let's go through actually, we're gonna ask Dana to please um, actually share a link. And the way we'll do this is in the chat window, you're gonna see a link that Dana shared. And that link is gonna take you to a website and you're gonna interact with that website and the website is going to look like this. It's going to start like this. If you get sound in there, if you wouldn't mind just for your own sakes so that we can have our conversation, just muting that particular window in the browser. And what you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to interact with this experience and think about this as a replacement of and instead of the, um, instead of the trade show floor. Imagine walking around this experience and not a trade show floor and being able to interact and move through it and select all these little green elements are selectable. There's videos there's playing, there's other kinds of interactive experiences. You can use your mouse to traverse this. You enter the stadium, you go in, and now instead of a trade show floor, I'm actually in a stadium and this is done by CenturyLink. And in order to explain, they have a tremendously high value uh, network communications infrastructure and um, IT infrastructure and being able to explain the value of all of their solutions can actually get quite complicated. But if you actually demonstrate the result of their infrastructure, 
it simplifies that complexity greatly. So you can walk around this, think about this as an experience instead of a trade show, and you want to go in and you, you want to look at a particular section or you want to get gamification, you might be able to actually interact in this environment, play a game, you might actually be able to go out and learn about different services that these providers have and how, what it means to you and based on your particular needs, that would translate into something very specific. And so you're learning about things that mean something to you. You're not just going to booths, you're not just walking around a trade show floor, you're actually looking at things that actually have some impact and some value to your particular persona and your needs. And what this does for you is it gives you the kind of experience and the kind of value that you don't really get when you're walking around a booth. People have booths because they're in a trade show floor and there's no way to create a stadium like this. But in the digital world, we're, we don't have those limitations. We're not limited by the conference room. We're not limited by the Javis Center or the Moscone Center. We're basically free to create whatever digital environment makes sense to us and is gonna resonate with our customers. Now you'll see a couple of things. I'm showing this to you, but you're actually interacting with yourselves. I don't know which buttons you've been clicking on and which sections you've been reading and which parts of the stadium you've been exploring. And the value of that is that you've been doing it based on what's interesting to you and what's relevant to you. And that's part of this personalized journey. We can create this very, very comprehensive and compelling experience and everybody who attends is gonna have their own personalized journey through this. Now that link that you just had, feel free to keep it and use it later. I'm gonna ask you to actually come back to the webinar so we can do some others and show you some other solutions. But this is what we talk about um, when we talk about a transformation. Rather than recreating a physical event the way the physical event is limited, we now have certain uh, unlimited capabilities um, with respect to all of these environments. And so what we're going to do um, we essentially have the capability to create any kind of environment that our customers care about. So let's go and look at another one. Um, this one actually uh, is a lab, and I'm going to show you this from the perspective of a lab workflow. And here you can see that it has the same sorts of characteristics as that stadium, but it's very specific to a particular lab. So we'll dive into the lab and we'll look at the workflow in the lab. And um, in this lab, what will happen is we'll be able to actually tour a workflow and we'll be able to see all of the different stations and learn about the products and solutions as they relate to us, but it's interactive. This is not a video, it's not a PowerPoint. I can move it around. I can go in any order or any direction. I can see all of the instruments, the workflow. I can learn about how to uh, use this. I can learn about optimizing my workflow. And I can learn about detailed products, which is obviously one of the reasons people go to these events, but I'm doing it at a pace and at a, um, in a context that's meaningful to me. So all of these, this is created uh, by a company, uh, Thermo Fisher Scientific, one of the most advanced life sciences companies in the world. And their vision is to create customer engagement at every touch point. So every time a customer is engaging with their company, they're, they're involved in these immersive environments. They're learning because they're uh, engaged in all three of those uh, levels, the sensory, multi-sensory level, the intellectual level, and the emotional level. And all of this is critically important because it's creating an environment for us to learn from, but we're not actually experiencing that limitation of the trade show. Now, all of these experiences can be specific to a particular industry or a customer or a domain or a, a persona, and they can be any kind of experience. But imagine creating an IT experience where you're in a data center and you're learning about solutions, hardware, software, integration services. You're in a, a, a plant and you're learning about the throughput of the plant and you're learning about the operational effectiveness and efficiency of the plant. All of these give you a much better context for learning rather than just having to traverse sort of that physical environment. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a physical environment. It could be a conceptual environment. Here we see an application uh, that uh, Micron has which is a really a, a way to experience a customer journey for, for very small products, DRAM chips and memory chips, but in the context of all of the value and the benefits that they provide. And so you're able to actually weave your way through these stories based on what industry you're in and what uh, persona you have, what role you play, and what, you're in, what level of detail you're interested in so that you can have this kind of experience even if it's not a, a physical real world experience. And it can traverse anything from office spaces 
to anything else. We can even go in, uh, let's do another quick one, Dana. I think we have time to do one more um, for the, um, the offshore oil platform. So we're going to actually uh, get to, this is an application where you'll need to get down to this offshore platform, but as you'll see, when we get there, um, it's actually, um, there's a series of potential areas of involvement there. And so instead of just going straight to the offshore platform, we can actually um, we can navigate and go to the oil and gas. That will tell us here's the entire landscape for the oil and gas uh, market. You select the map, then you can select any of these. And let's say we do want to go to the offshore oil platform, we go to offshore production, you see all of the information that Baker Hughes, which is a leading oil and gas services and products company, um, their message is um, highly differentiated, but complex to elucidate and articulate that differentiated message. And so if we select any one of these value stories here, these are all values that they deliver, increased safety, improved process efficiency, uh, reduction in CapEx and OpEx. What that does is it allows us to actually go right into an environment rather than a trade show booth. So we're in this environment, we're exploring the environment, you're actually exploring it, you're zooming around, but you're also learning about their products and their services. So when they're talking about particular solutions, it's relevant to you and it means something to you. You don't have to bridge that gap of what products they have and what environment you're gonna be able to use it in. So simplifying very complex messages by creating these highly resonant interactive um, experiences that are transformative because they're not taking you through an artificial experience like a booth, they're taking you through something that's much closer to a real world experience. And you can actually walk through these and traverse them at, at any pace that's relevant to you. And again, these are the kinds of links that you're gonna keep. I'm gonna just ask you to come back to our uh, webinar for a moment so that we can actually um, show you some other kinds of experiences. Now, if you uh, recall in your polling, you said that one of the top three uh, requirements for doing these kinds of events was to be able to show products and solutions and differentiated value. And then also one of the deficiencies of the current uh, virtual or digital experience environments was inability to show uh, products and uh, services and solutions in a way that shows differentiated value. So we're gonna actually show one here which gives you the kind of interactive capability and Dana's gonna share this experience, which is actually an interactive product demonstration, very similar to the ones that we just did. Um, but this one's gonna focus on products. And um, so we're gonna be able to demonstrate and you're gonna drive this yourself. You can move it around with your mouse. You can look in the back, look in the front. And then if you see, there's an explore product animations link in the top left hand side, you select that and then you can open it up take components out, learn about the differentiated value of the key individual components, how they uh, represent a breakthrough in technology or ease of use or um, higher throughput. So in this case, you're learning about value, not just the technology, you're learning about low latency communications and that these particular components are driving that value. And so there's so much that people wanna learn at different levels just giving everybody exactly the same messaging doesn't create resonance for them. Allowing people to dive in and have this kind of experience at their own pace and at the level of detail that's relevant to them, that's what drives that kind of engagement. Remember that emotional connection, the intellectual knowledge transfer and the multi-sensory experience. This is all happening right here because we're creating the ability for us to show what's better and different and more valuable to the customer about our products. So there's an environment, there's an entire transition from a physical trade show environment to a digital immersive experience for them. And then there's the ability to dive in and see any kind of product detail that's relevant and makes a difference to the customer when it comes to making buying decisions. I'm gonna ask you to come back to the webinar again. Again, all of these links are available to you. You have them now and Dana's gonna share them with you at the end. Um, to tie this back together, I think one of the most important aspects as we think about the future is that we can't just create one-off solutions. We can't just create individual trade shows or individual product launch events or individual customer meetings and have them be a snapshot in time. What we have to do is we have to think about this entire continuum as a digital environment. 
So when we create these experiences, we're actually creating them with respect to the entire uh, customer journey. Their problem solving journey starts by being aware of what the issues are. We need to create these kinds of experiences for them so we can put them on the website. We actually have awareness at some of these industry trade shows and maybe some of our own events, but we're letting the customer drive. You were on this, um, in this collaboration together, but you were the one driving it. You were the one doing the interacting. You were the one learning. You were actually experiencing that entire environment. And that can happen at any phase and at different levels of detail, depending on which phase you're at. So it can be that during the decision-making phase, you're at the much more detailed product differentiation level. Whereas at the earlier stages of awareness, you're much more about value stories. And then when you're in the implementation level and even the post uh, purchase level, where we're cr creating customer value and upsell and cross sell opportunities, we're talking about integration and scalability and all the other kinds of things that our solutions provide and giving customers the ability to learn that themselves so that they're the ones experiencing it. and We're not just presenting to them. Very importantly, the digital world gives us the ability to reuse and repurpose and re redistribute all of these kinds of experiences without having to start from scratch. So now we've got these great experiences. We can have them in multiple languages. We can have them regionalized so that certain products are featured or limited. We can have them be uh, transitioned so that at particular moments in time, they emphasize different solutions based on whatever the industry situation is. Customers can use them on their own uh, devices. We can have them on the web. And even when we have these limited face-to-face -face engagements, we can create terrific gesture-based or voice-based interactive experiences that aren't touch-based, even though the touch-based um, interactions, of course, they work, but they may not be appropriate in, in the short and medium term. So having the digital framework is the way to think about this as a long-term transformation process. We're not talking about investing or expending money. Remember, we're going from a cost-based to a value-based model. We're not talking about an expense of a show. We're talking about a transformation, a digital transformation that lets us actually elevate the role that marketing's playing from being seen as more of a cost center to being very aligned with the co company's revenue and customer engagement um, strategies. And when you think about the CEO level strategic imperatives, the more we can do to align marketing with those C CEO level imperatives, the more importance we're going to play in respect to actually achieving those objectives. And our ability to help the company achieve those objectives is greatly enhanced when we deliver a transformative platform as opposed to a standalone application. And so think about these as a continuum. It's a platform. It's a journey. And what we're going to be doing is thinking about elevating customer engagement at every stage along this journey. Now, what's important is these kinds of capabilities exist today. So we don't have to wait for 2022 before we can get started. We can create these interactive experiences, whether they're product-based or storytelling, and we can extend them from a breadth and a depth perspective as our uh, messaging evolves and as our customer experience journey evolves. So these are going to play a role as an investment over all of these phases as we emerge from the coronavirus-induced economic situation that we're in we're going to actually really look at the future as an elevated performance as opposed to returning back to where we started from. So I, I hope you're as excited as I am about what the future holds. I think if we all work together to elevate customer experience, we'll be focusing on all the right things. And instead of trying to recreate things, we'll actually be trying to invent the future. And that's where I think all of our emotional excitement and our potential for value comes. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back over to Dana. Thank you very much, Gavin. I appreciate that. And I just want to reiterate again, I know Gavin mentioned it, I mentioned it. You will get a copy of today's recording. We do get a lot of questions um, that have come in asking for it, as well as the interactive links we'll share with you. So let's jump right into the Q&A section. Uh, a question came in from Sarah. Are you able to incorporate live video streams into your applications? Yes. Yeah, so each of these applications can incorporate two kinds of interaction. One would be a live video feed, which is a sort of a broadcast. You can have somebody um, having a broadcast video feed that is happening at exactly the same time. You can also create a live chat session. So let's say, for example, if you had industry experts that were available and you wanted to have an inter interactive chat session, you were able to have that 
with maybe a product expert or an industry expert. So we can create live um, experiences and recorded or asynchronous experiences at the same time. I think you actually just answered uh, Nancy's question, which came in next, which was uh, looking, looking to engage with subject matter experts. Is there a way for us to create that rather than just clicking our hotspots? Sounds like you just addressed that. I hope I addressed it. But again, of course, all of these are possible within this environment. You know? So we can think of these as, um, as capabilities for all kinds of engagement, right? Question came in from Chris. Do most clients see this solution as a live event or is it something that is pushed out as a synchronized experience or synchronous experience? Yeah, so it can be live or asynchronous or both. And so let's think about, for example, if you wanted to create a live experience, what you might actually do is create a gamification process where we brought people together, everybody was interacting, doing similar things to what you were just doing, let's say traversing a uh, an offshore oil platform, but you were actually answering questions or opening certain capabilities or doing product uh, capabilities or features. And then that happened live. You might have a leaderboard where we where you actually see how people are doing with respect to each other. But then the, the same capability is available either as a, a registered event which people can go to any time. So one of the key values here is that you can have this live event, but then you can also have it be available anytime, either afterwards or during or at any point. And then the other thing is you can make these experiences available on the customer's website, on your website, so that you can have your customers experience these at any time that's convenient to them. So thinking about these as digital modules to be able to be delivered in any of those environments. Now, a lot of companies are thinking about, well, we've just lost our ability to have live events. Let's create a live digital experience and so this is a great way to make that experience come to, to fruition, but you can also then reuse it later. So it's not an either or. You just answered Chris's question as well. So we'll jump over to MK. Um, can your platform incorporate voice activation features? Yes, so anything that you can activate with a mouse or with a touch screen or anything else can be voice activated features as well. And we have that capability um, and in fact, that's part of our transition plan for phase two when we have these limited engagements rather than asking people to come in and touch screens, which they may not be comfortable with and we probably would not advise. Um, all of the actions that we've had here that you've seen, whether it's mouse based or touch screen based, like on an iPad or a large touch screen at a trade show or a briefing center, can be voice activated as well. A question from Joanna, how are your current clients using these links slash digital experiences? Are they sending out email blasts or driving people to their website? Actually, there's a variety of ways. Let me give you a couple of live examples or real world examples. So one, um, one of our clients has a, about a thousand salespeople globally. And what they've tried to do is to start by having sales interactions that came after these marketing events where the customer is on the other end of a Zoom call or a WebEx call or a go-to-meeting call like this, and the salesperson actually sends the customer that link while they're in the session, and the customer shares their screen. So the customer is doing what you were doing, driving it, but the salesperson can actually see it. So from a sales perspective, they're having the customer do the engagement, but it's a guided session, the salesperson's involved. There are other use cases, in fact, in that same company, where they have been sending out the link to a certain portion of the experience, not the whole thing, but one portion as a teaser in the email. So the email is used as a demand generator to actually create more of a face-to-face -face with the salespeople. So they send that link out, the customer interacts, it happens online, and then they either get right there to sign up for a, a sales session or they can make a call or they can register uh, using the company's uh, website registration process. And then the third, uh, way that they're using it, this is just one company, is that they're actually sending these out um, to drive people to a, um, a branded section of the website so that there is a specific message on the website around the, the particular experience that they're delivering. And they actually do this every quarter. They have a different um, experience that they're focused on. So every time they send an email blast out, they're driving people to a particular location on their website. These experiences are embedded in the website using iframes. And so the customer is able to experience it and it's driven for a particular, as part of a particular marketing campaign as well. 
Question came in from Sura. I hope I pronounced that correctly. How does your platform compare to virtual event platforms like VFair, Inexpo, et cetera? Thanks. We actually collaborate with all of those platforms because they're the ones who provide that list of things that we talked about with respect to a website for the event and agenda and live chat and all those kinds of capabilities and our, our systems integrate with theirs. So if you have one of those, you don't have to, but if you do, then our system can actually be the uh, virtual experience like the, uh, we just saw the, the lab or the uh, stadium or the offshore rig or whatever it is. And then each of the sponsors has their own section within that, or that experience can be uh, a link within their, their trade show environment. So if they have a set, set of booths, company, let's say Baker Hughes in the case of the offshore platform, says we don't want to have a booth, we want to have an offshore platform. So rather than using that, let's call it standard off the shelf booth, we, we actually put an iframe in and the customers are experiencing it that way. We also can integrate with their analytics. So that if they have driven people to your virtual event and they're counting how many people came and how long they spent and all of that, any of the analytics in our experience can be um, exported using an API for them to actually extract it and integrate it into their experience as well. Thank you. It looks like um, it might be our last question here from Mika. Can it be accessed on a mobile or tablet? Yes. In fact, everything we've just seen is an experience that can be used um, online, can be used on a desktop, can be used on mobile, and it can be used um, either on an iPhone or a um, a uh, Samsung phone or Android phone or anything like that, or it can be used um, on a, uh, a tablet, whether it's a, an iPad or a, um, uh, an Android tablet or anything like that. So any, any tablet that's got exactly the same, uh, we have exactly the same capability. And the, when we talked about reusability of the applications, um, the same application is used um, on um, all of those platforms without having to write a specific mobile version or a specific web version or a specific desktop version. That digital um, a series of applications run everywhere, um, just natively. Oh, and it looks like one last question came in from Peter. Um, can you integrate gamification into your apps and virtual platforms? What we've done is we've integrated gamification as the experiences. So we've actually created a variety of gamification applications, including, um, I'll give you one as an example. <clears throat> we had a, um, an experience that we created to help demonstrate how a software that's used to configure servers in the data center or in the cloud um, is easy to use. So we created a gamification environment where multiple people at the same time came in and they all were exposed to the software user interface. And the um, purpose was to show how easy that software is to use. And so as soon as the clock started, everybody started configuring servers. And at the end of the one minute or the five minutes, um, whoever configured the most servers won the game. And you could see the leaderboard and it was actually global. It could be anywhere in the world. And so that's one way to make a live event really successful. So we can turn any of these experiences into gamification experiences and they can have leaderboards and they can be global, and then you can integrate those data with the rest of your systems as well. And we got one more question from Brad. Does the platform su support VR, either through Google Cardboard type mobile platforms or standalone platforms such as Oculus Go? The application that you saw, for example, the CenturyLink application, um, is actually was originally developed as an immersive application, and it runs as a completely VR, fully 3D immersive application on a, a Oculus Quest or uh, any of the other devices. And the same application runs on the web and it also runs on native uh, apps on your iPad or on your Mac or your Windows device. So these applications can be designed for VR, but the beautiful part about the platform is that when you create a VR application, it can also work in a non-VR environment without having to recreate a separate application. Now, some of those VR experiences are incredibly powerful. We have a, a space configuration application, for example, that allows you to configure labs and data centers and other kinds of things. And then you can actually use the VR experience to walk through that space that you just configured look to see if you can access for maintenance purposes or if there's enough room for human workflow or if devices will actually fit through walls. 
And in addition to virtual reality, the same applications work uh, with augmented reality. So we can actually take those product demonstrations like the IBM mainframe that we saw, and we can use them in augmented reality and place them directly into a physical environment in life size. So you can see what the product looks like, you can see if it would fit, you can actually see those products in your space. So because there's this platform that allows us to implement these applications in whatever environment makes the most amount of sense for the customer. We got one last question came in from Ryan. How soon can you measure analytics? The analytics um, are measured uh, continuously. We typically collect them um, and display them and update them weekly, but they are being collected real time. Um, so we have the ability, for example, to integrate with things like Marketo and others where if you're on the website, for example, you can integrate those websites in real, those web analytics in real time into those uh, systems. But if you're just looking at the Kaon um, environment, we actually collect them real time and then we get a weekly update because we're aggregating data over the time. All of that's customizable, of course. Fabulous. I think that does it for today, Gavin. I appreciate you taking the time to answer all those questions. We had a lot more streaming in than I'd hoped. There's a couple more that we might have to answer after the webinar as well. Um, so that, that concludes today's event um, and the, the Elite Marketing Webinar, bringing the value of face-to-face -face into virtual meetings, briefings, and events. Gavin, I just, again, want to thank you for joining us and sharing these critical B2B marketing insights. And we look forward to speaking and reaching out to everyone after the event and seeing if we can help in any way with your digital transformation efforts. Gavin, thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for attending. It's been a real pleasure. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.